homosexuality is a disease-ridden, sterile occupation. Ben Bradshaw is homosexual, rides a bicycle, speaks German, works for the BBC. He's everything about our country that is wrong, and if I was elected, the Exeter's children would be in danger. So that was the kind of tone wow. of the campaign. Um, but it meant that the campaign was, very, as you can imagine, very high profile internationally as well as nationally. We had the world's media descending on, on poor old Exeter. Ben Bradshaw, welcome to your exit interview. A chance for us all to learn what you could have done better. So, first of all, why are you leaving us? Uh, I'm 62, I'll be 63 this summer. Uh, I didn't want to be rattling around the House of Commons as I approached 70, which could theoretically be possible if uh, I stood again and served a full parliament. Um, and I want to have a bit of time for myself, for my family, for my friends who've kind of sacrificed a lot really to put up with the life that uh, I've been leading in the last um, quarter of a century or more. Uh, and yeah, we've got plans to do other things. So um, it just felt like, felt like the right time and also a good time to hand on to the next generation in my constituency, provide Keir with some new young blood, with some with fresh ideas and youthful energy <laughs> and so forth. Um, so yeah, all in all, it's, it felt like it's the right time. time. Let's go right back to the beginning then. Uh, you were originally a, a BBC journalist before you became an MP. There is part of me that always is a bit sad when a journalist jumps over to, into politics. It feels a bit like it sort of blurs the lines for the rest of us. But I won't hold that against you. <laughs> Why did you go from reporting on the news to sort of trying to make it? Well, quite a few fellow journalists had that. Uh, reaction when, when they learned I was going into politics. I mean, it was, for some it was a bit stronger than that. <laughs> it was more like betrayal. Um, but look, no, I mean, I, I'd always been um, engaged in politics and in political life. I'd been a member of the Labour Party when I worked on the local paper down in Exeter. Um, uh, I'd kind of followed politics. I came from you know a, a family that was, that, that was engaged in and talked about politics a lot. One of my older brothers once stood for Parliament. Um, some of my ancestors on my mother's side were Irish politicians before partition on, uh, from both uh, oh, yeah. parties actually yeah. so um, uh, so there was a bit of politics in the blood I suppose uh, and you know I'd grown up uh, as my generation had under a very long term of a conservative government and Thatcher and all of that um, and uh, when um, Tony Blair got the leadership of the Labour Party I felt for the first time really in my adult life that there was a chance of a change um, I had had the huge privilege and good fortune to uh, be in Berlin when the Berlin Wall came down and, and have that story land in my lap. And uh, you know, when I came back and worked for the BBC in London, it was a great job. I was travelling all around the world covering Clinton's election campaigns and other amazing stuff. Um, but I always asked myself, what am I going to do that's going to kind of beat what happened in Berlin? And then um, somebody actually suggested to me that uh, there was a vacancy in Exeter. Um, because of uh, uh, the sitting Labour candidate um, having to stand down. And uh, I put my name forward, never really expecting to be selected as a complete kind of novice, didn't do any canvassing, um, and won in the final selection but in single figures. I can't remember, seven, eight, nine votes, and the rest is history. Uh, let's talk about that campaign. You were uh, up against your Tory opponent in 1997, Adrian Rogers, from the religious right. And you. You suffered a lot of homophobia, didn't you? I mean, it, 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 it sort of, on the one hand, 97 didn't seem like that long ago, but in social terms, it really was. Yeah, and when I, when I tell young people today about that campaign, they look at me in complete disbelief. I mean, uh, I knew Adrian Rogers because I'd, 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 I'd often quoted him in the paper, and indeed he was often quoted in the national paper whenever the national press wanted a homophobic quote. They went to him. Uh, and uh, I, was the f I, was, um, I was not going to seek selection from the local Labour Party members on the basis of non-full disclosures. So in my selection pitch, I said at the end of my speech, and there's one more thing you need to know about me, you know, I'm gay, always have been, I'm not about to jump back in the closet, some of you know that, some of you may not, um, but I want you to select me on the basis of, of knowing that. And, and they did, and I was the first openly gay candidate to be selected and then elected in British political history. So. 
Rogers, as soon as my selection happened, came out with some very, very fruity uh, quotes. Um, homosexuality is a disease-ridden, sterile occupation. Ben Bradshaw is homosexual, rides a bicycle, speaks German, works for the BBC. Has everything about our country that is wrong, and if I was elected, the Exeter's children would be in danger. So that was the kind of tone wow. of the campaign. Um, but it meant that the campaign was, very, as you can imagine, very high profile internationally as well as nationally. We had the world's media descending on, on poor old Exeter and uh, it became a bit of a cool celebra. Um, but it, was also, it also marked a real watershed in British politics where I think some of the attitudes of the political parties but also the media had not caught up or kept up with where the public were. You know, we'd had Michael Cashman who had gay characters on, on, on soaps. A lot of people had gay friends and relatives. And yet there was still quite a strong strand of homophobia. It was against the backdrop of Section 28, that piece of legislation, yeah. if you remember, that the Conservatives passed in the middle of the moral panic about gay, pe gay pe children being made gay at school. You know, I mean, our understanding of human sexuality has changed and developed enormously yeah. in that time. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a, that was part of my motivation, I have to say, to stand against Rogers, was I thought, you know, um, a, this guy needs to be beaten, but wouldn't it be kind of sweet if he was beaten by an openly gay man? Was there ever a point during that campaign where you thought, oh, I really wish I hadn't got into this? I mean, no. it's sort of striking that 25, 26 years on, you can still quote verbatim yeah, the stuff yeah. that was thrown at you. Well, it I've clearly I've told the story. affected you. I've yeah. told the story so many times. Um, I think, uh, not me, I think probably my sister, you know, was pretty upset yeah. and some of, my, um, some, of the, some of my nearest and dearest. But I think because I had, I had always had a, you know, I, I came out at a time when it was very difficult, you know, actually quite difficult for a lot of people to come out, but it wasn't difficult for me because I had incredibly supportive, my mother died when I was young, so she, she, she wasn't around, but my dad, who was a Church of England uh, priest, uh, was incredibly supportive and very loving, uh, the rest of my family were and all my friends were, so it had never been a, coming out for me had never been you know, it's, it's always a, a difficult and a tricky thing because we, you know, we, you grew up in a heteronormative world, but it had never been a painful or a traumatic, traumatic experience as it can still be for some people. So I think I was probably a bit, I had a bit more of a thick skin and a bit more confidence in my, in my life and in my sexuality. I had a, a lovely partner in Neil. We'd been together for a while and you know, fully committed relationship. So I had that domestic ballast, ballast as well. So no, it didn't didn't affect me. And if anything, I think it kind of it, it, it drove me on yeah. uh, to work harder and do better. And also, you know, I never kind of actually when I when I was elected in the campaign, I, I never made a thing of, of being gay. It was always uh, the, the, the the Tories who did that. You know, I focused on bread and butter issues, and I felt I suppose a bit like David Blunkett once said that you know the best the best way to support and and advance the rights of blind and disabled people is to be a very competent uh, and able blind or disabled minister. And I just thought, you know, I happen to be gay, but I want to do a good yeah. job for my constituents. And because that's the best way I can show them and the country that, you know, gay people aren't all weird and, and, and wacky and, and, and whatever. Yeah. And what was it like then arriving in the House of Commons of 1997? It was part of this enormous sort of landslide, you know, loads of people there who weren't ever expecting to become MPs. <laughs> what was that like in general being part of the landslide but also being a, a gay MP arriving in Parliament? It was amazing uh, and I wasn't the only one of course Stephen yeah. Twigg was elected yeah. on the same night uh, famously against, against Michael Portillo um, and uh, I mean you know I, you, that, that, that sense of kind of optimism and euphoria that those of us who are old enough to remember was very very real and uh, it was very real and it lasted a very long time, you know, and uh, you know, I, uh, I felt very awe, awestruck, as I think most people do when they first arrive in the House of Commons, um, but I was completely focused on getting up and running, getting a, uh, an office up and running so I could start doing the work, getting stuck in um, and, you know, doing my job, representing my constituents and uh, um, supporting the legislative programme of the Labour government. Uh, and uh, you know I would, that's what I did, and I had a, a parliament on the back benches. I was very grateful for that. I think there's a lot to be said for for not for not kind of rising up the ranks too quickly, um, and you know winning your spurs first and doing your time and gaining experience. Um, so, and also, I think when I was first elected, I had no expectation that I would necessarily 
be an MP for that long because Exeter had always been a Conservative mm -hmm. constituency except for one brief period in the 1960s and the natural pendulum of politics I, I expected would swim back, swing back at some stage. So I was, you know, I, I would say I'm going to make the most of this, you know, five or ten years I might be privileged yeah. enough to be here, never expecting that I'd still be here 27, <laughs> 27 years later. Well, uh, let me take you through then. So as part of the, uh, the exit interview, we'd like to reflect on your various bosses to see how, mm. they've, uh, how they've been. So let's start with, um, could you sum up Tony Blair in a word? I, the best... Uh, post-war Prime Minister that we've had, certainly since Attlee, uh, in my view, a delight to work for. Not always easy. Um, oh, tell me when it wasn't easy. That's well, uh, he could be quite difficult to read. Um, uh, and sometimes he, he wasn't so good at the personal touches as, say, Gordon was. But I think in terms of being a Prime Minister, he was better and more rounded. And his great strength, I mean, I remember when I was on a train with, with him and um, Alistair Campbell in Exeter, probably around the foot and mouth thing or something like that, um, uh, there was just the three of us at the end of a carriage, uh, sort of half carriage sealed off. And um, I remember being sort of quite shocked by how Alistair was speaking to Tony, um, sort of like a naughty schoolboy really telling him off. Um, but, you know, when you look back and you also read about what happened, because obviously I wasn't in the inner circle at that stage, um, it's quite clear to me that you know, Tony had amazing people around him. Yeah. And it says a lot about a leader that, that they appoint people who challenge them and tell them when they're wrong and give them a hard time. And I think that's, such an, it's, that's so important in a leader. And, and you know, if you think about some of the other people, Angie Hunter, uh, Sally Morgan, yeah. the people around Tony, they were, they were way, way better than I think anyone we've seen since uh, around a Prime Minister or a number 10. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I really liked and yeah. admired Tony. I still do. I still have contact with him. And I, I'm also a huge fan of Cherie. I mean, Cherie was, was incredibly, incredibly supportive of newly elected MPs like me. She was also very, very good on LGBT issues. I mean, she really pushed the envelope on that. I think a lot of stuff that we did in government wouldn't have happened if she hadn't been That's so. Oh yeah, she was, um, she was a big ally and she would turn up at every kind of Stonewall and um, LGBT Labour event and support and, um, you know, give, she sent me a neat little present when we got married and stuff like that. So it was, um, those sort of touches were, were, yeah. were really nice. And then, you, like you said, you had a parliament on the back benches mm -hmm. and then after 2001, uh, you, you joined the government, you were made a foreign office minister. You had an not, only a couple of days after 9-11 you had to appear at the dispatch box. That must have been a big moment. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm not sure Tony had thought through the consequences of, of, uh, of appointing uh, an openly gay um, MP to be a minister for what in effect was most of the Muslim world. It was in my, was in my area of responsibility. But yes, um, uh, and yeah, we had 9-11 uh, uh, quite soon after I was appointed. I had to dash back. I was actually away in, in Italy. I had to dash back um, from holiday, but one of many interrupted or ruined, <laughs> ruined holidays I had as a minister. Um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, and then represent the government at the dispatch box. Um, so it was, uh, you know, it was a kind of baptism of fire, really, d doing that job at the time I did it. And um, yeah, we had all the, those consequences to deal with. You were then Robin Cook's yep. deputy as uh, Commons leader. Again, at quite a big time, particularly, you know, because that was the job he was he resigned as uh, yep. over Iraq. Did you yep. try to talk him out of that? No, uh, I didn't, and I don't think he would have been talkable out of it. Um, I mean, Robin was a great man to work for. He was a bit of a lone cat. I mean, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't share. He certainly didn't share his views uh, on that with me at the time. Um, he he kept he kept his his views very close to his chest. Um, I, I had a lot of admiration for him for his integrity, and I you know I also fully supportive of of his position on things like PR and, and constitutional reform. Um, uh, I, dis I disagreed with him on, on Iraq, um, but um, I thought, you know, for him he did the honourable thing and he did it uh, in great style. And I think it was a tragedy that we then lost him so young, because uh, um, he would have been brilliant during the whole Bre all, all that Brexit stuff, wouldn't he? I mean, he was such a, such a fantastic uh, um, uh, politician at the dispatch box. Um, demolish, he would completely demolish uh, the Conservative spokespeople. and. Um, I think the Labour Party, you know, really misses him and, and people like him. Those great titans from Scotland that 
that were so big in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. He was right about Iraq as well, though, wasn't he? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think in hindsight, you know, you can argue that the Iraq War was a mistake, but at the time, uh, the whole of the Western world accepted um, the, the view, as did the United Nations, that Saddam Hussein uh, was rebuilding a weapons of mass destruction program in breach of United Nations uh, resolutions. And the question really was, no one disagreed with that. The question was how you dealt with that and how uh, he'd already waged war in, on two of his enemies, uh, killed a million of his own people. Um, and uh, I don't, you know, Robin Cook I didn't disagree with the premise that this was happening. He just disagreed with um, the decision taken at that time to take military action. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's one of the things I don't resile from uh, my vote. And if you look at if you look at who voted for it at the time, it was uh, it was overwhelmingly passed by MPs on all sides of the house. So, um, uh, you know, it's Robin took that view, um, and. You know, one can speculate as to what his, I mean, he, he spelled out his reasons, but, um, um, and, you know, in, in, in hindsight, you know, he, you could say that he, he, he was right. However, at the time, um, I, I didn't feel he was yeah. right. And um, I think, uh, you know, if you look at what's happened in Syria, for example, uh, uh, where we, um, or the West, didn't take any action, we, Obama drew a red line and then backed off. Cameron had that disastrous vote in Parliament and, uh, and then backed off and didn't go back to it. The results in Syria have been far, far worse than what happened in Iraq and they're still, we're still living with them. Still I mean, the Nigan crisis yeah. and the awful situation in Syria itself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can always make an argument about not taking military action, but I think you have to also be prepared to defend what happens when you don't. Um, you've, had, you've had quite a lot of junior ministerial jobs before you got to the Cabinet. Foreign Office, DEFA, Health. Deputy Leader of the Commons, what was your favourite? I put actually more, probably more interestingly, which one did you really not enjoy? I enjoyed them all. I mean, I think I, I felt I felt I got a bit stuck at DEFRA. I was in DEFRA for four years, um, and we had a lot to deal with. You know, we had foot and mouth, we had bird flu, we did we were doing lots of led, environmental legislation. That was great. I mean, I loved the environmental and fisheries and animal welfare side of that job. It's something. There are issues the public really care about, and we did a lot of good stuff when we were in government. Why do, you um, think, why do you think you got, because uh, that was when you and I knew each other most, when I was at the West Morning News, and I think you were at DEFRA. Yeah. Why do you think, because normally you'd, that's the sort of job you'd have zipped through in a year or well, two. Well, one, Tony, one of Tony's um, close advisors did, did kind of intimate to me that uh, 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 at one stage that, that I'd, be, I'd been forgotten about. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's always a danger, I think, when you're in government, that you have ministers who are just getting on quietly and hopefully reasonably competently doing a job. Um, and uh, I've never been a very clubbable person. I'm not one of these people who would hang around in the tea rooms and, and kind of butter people up. And um, also, being an MP, a Labour MP from the southwest, you're not part of a gang. Not part of not 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 a, not a big gang. Of no Labour big MPs. no big regional base. Yeah. I wasn't a, I wasn't the kind of Labour MP who'd come up through the NUS yeah. and, and Labour students and all of that kind of stuff. I didn't know. Men, I didn't know any other MPs. Um, we, we, you know, Neil and I had no politicians at our wedding, you know, which is, is, is quite unusual. Well, actually, we did. We had a, New, Ze we had a New Zealand <laughs> politician, but, but no, Brit no British one. Yeah. Actually, it makes um, you normal, is the, well, is the other yeah, sort of... You can say that. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I couldn't possibly uh, <laughs> uh, make a claim to normality. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, didn't, I didn't really have those yeah. networks. And I, 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 w I didn't push, you know. I yeah. mean, I, I, one heard some quite <laughs> interesting stories about other ministers and how they behaved around reshuffles and tantrums and things like that. I mean, I, I just kind of... When Gordon rang me up once uh, to apologise that he wasn't to apologise that he wasn't promoting me. I was in a piano bar in Mykonos. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I had to find, first of all, I had to find a quiet corner, which is quite difficult in Mykonos, as you can imagine. Um, but I managed, managed to find a, a, sort of a portico, portico of, a, of a church. I said, Gordon, for heaven's sake, please don't apologise for not promoting me. I'm lo that was when I was at Health. I said, I'm loving my job. And, um, and Health was, I mean, Health was, was probably the most satisfying, particularly working with Alan Johnson, Great man, uh, again, really, really miss yeah. him from frontline politics. Um, and at a time when the NHS, I mean, those who remember, but it was really rolling. You know, we had the, the shortest waiting times in history, the highest patient and staff satisfaction, and you really felt you were delivering something that the, that the public cared about. So that was a really good feeling. And then obviously to go from there into the cabinet for culture, media, and sport, 
Um, I mean, I've never, never, I've, I've, I've always been open about the fact that sport's not my strong suit, but I had a very good sports minister who loved the fact that yeah, I delegated yeah, yeah. to him and gave him all the tickets. <laughs> when I can, which meant I could go to the opera and the theatre and the art stuff galleries. like that. Yeah. So yeah, in fact, we've been, so, what, so what did you say to Gordon? You were quite happy with it, health when he phoned you and you're in Mykonos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I was aware he had, he had other people to deal with who were perhaps being a bit more um, pushy and yeah. um, uh, jostling around. So uh, yeah, and also I kind of think the Prime Minister's job is really difficult and doing reshuffles is really difficult. And actually, Gordon was better at reshuffles than Tony. That's one of the... It's really interesting. Yeah. You're, cause Tony wasn't very good at reshuffles. People will think that Tony Blair was the, the people guy, people mm. pleaser, and mm -hmm. Gordon's the sort of cantankerous mm -hmm. bloke that people can mm -hmm. get on with. And actually, it sounds like Gordon was better with his colleagues. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think uh, I think um, uh, I think I, I think no. I think Gordon was Gordon was slightly more socially awkward than Tony. I mean, Tony's I think got good emotional and yeah. social intelligence and social skills. I, you know, Gordon's slightly he's got that kind of slightly Scottish Presbyterian um, um, seriousness. But yeah. you know, the, the, you know, the, the flip side of that is he's a serious man, which yeah. you know is a very important part of his strength and his qualities. Um, but he was, he was, his reshuffles, as I experienced them, seemed to be a little bit more organised yeah, yeah. and, and more strategic. Um, uh, I mean, he had, he maybe, you know, and also he had to do some quite difficult ones, you know, because after the, uh, when I was promoted to the cabinet, it was off the back of James Purnell resigning, you know, oh, and yeah, people yeah. were expecting, people, were people well, people were expecting, or people, some people were expecting a, a kind of, uh, push against Gordon for, uh, uh, at that stage because we had such bad results and the polls were looking really bad. Um, but actually, you know, those those crises were all managed very well. And you know, Gordon had the uh, good sense and foresight to appoint people like Peter Mandelson and, and Stephen Carter to bring greater functionality to Downing Street. So. I mean, it was a. They were both. I mean, compared with what we've had since, they were, <laughs> they were both incredibly competent and functional administrations. Well, let's go back to my list then of uh, summing up your leaders and one your, mm. your bosses in a single word. Gordon Brown in a word. Uh, great man um, <laughs> would listen. Uh, and it's a lot of words, but yeah, listen. Change his mind. Uh, yeah. and change his mind uh, sometimes, which uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and you know, a, a huge brain as well. And you were. I think it's fair to say a Blairite. Yes. Were you surprised that it was Gordon Brown who ended up putting you in the cabinet rather than Tony? Uh, yes. Uh, well, no. I mean, I didn't have any expect. I didn't ha expect that Tony. Yes. I didn't think that Tony should have done it. Um, but I thought it was. Um, I thought it was uh, interesting and uh, rather reassuring, actually, about Gordon's uh, determination to have a cabinet that was broadly based mm. uh, to give somebody like me a job. But I would also, I mean, although I was, you know, I was a, considered to be a, a Blair, although I, these labels are not necessarily very helpful in always, always I don't think. I mean, they're, they're neat labels for, for commentators and journalists to use. But um, I, I would, Gordon had some really tough times and I was one of those ministers who would go out and fight for him, yeah. do those difficult media gigs. and. Um, I think that gets noticed, and you know, and 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 you know, for Gordon, very sensibly so, because you know, if you're a prime minister, you need people who are prepared to go and uh, go out and bat for you in the in the hard times and do those difficult interviews. Um, How do you do those interviews? Because there are there were a few, you know, like we see if if yeah. current prime minister's in trouble, Grant Shapps will be on the telly, with, you know, in no time at all. How do you sort of gear yourself up for knowing? You probably, there's nothing you can say which is going to deflect this trouble, but you're out there just to sort of smile and get through it. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are I mean, I suppose there are a number of, the most important thing is that you're well briefed. I mean, you can, you can tell and hear uh, a minister who's well briefed and on top of their brief and, um, and across the detail. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you need to make sure that you know as much, if not more, about that subject than the presenter. Um, and if you don't know the answer, you say you don't know the answer. Um, you do your best to command the interview and not allow it to be com commanded by the presenter and there are techniques and ways of doing that. You give short answers, you don't give long answers because that makes it more difficult for the presenter to think about the next question and trip you up. Um, so, and, so, and, so, and also, you, you answer the question and you sound like a human being. Yeah. You know, it's not that complicated. Uh, the, the, the best advice I ever had was actually when I was a local radio uh, reporter and we had voice training and my, um, I, had a terrible, I had a terrible broadcasting voice 
because um, I was trying to be something I wasn't and somebody I wasn't. And and um, and the and the training, very old BBC trainee guy says, just be yourself, relax and be yourself. And that's what I always try to do in interviews. Not always easy, but I mean, I you know, I've had some some of those interviews around the David uh, Kelly stuff and yeah. the and the Iraq War and the dossier and all that, the, the Gilligan yeah. stuff. Um, they were pretty, you know, 12 minutes with John Humphreys at 10 past 8. It was <laughs> it's, it's good training. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you build up your resilience. So then, of course, then of course, after 2010, Gordon Brown loses the election. Yeah. The Labour Party goes into opposition for the first time in 13 years. Uh, Ed Miliband, in a word. <sighs> well, I'm, I, I back David and um, <laughs> made that... <laughs> made that quite clear. Um, I think I, I've got a lot of time for Ed. I really like him. I think he's a great politician and I think he'll, ha he'll have, have a huge contribution to make in the next Labour government. I thought that David would have been the best leader and I think we made, made a mistake in not. And of course the party members agreed with me, um, as did, uh, as did the, the affiliate or organisations. It was the unions that swung it for Ed quite narrowly. Um, and I I, mean, I had an co honest conversation with Ed, and I, I, I said I didn't approve of, of the way that he was um, distancing himself from Tony and Gordon's achievements and legacy, um, not just over the Iraq War, but in particular over the Iraq War. He hadn't been in Parliament when we had that difficult vote, um, and um, yeah. So, and I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't asked to serve in his uh, shadow on his front bench, and uh, I've been very happy on the back benches ever since. I have to say, so. It's been, it's been quite a nice kind of rhythm to the second half of, of, of my political life. You, because um, obviously the, the, the next period on the, on the back benches was under, under, under Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn in a word? Disaster. Oh my goodness, that is actually a single um, word. Disaster for the Labour Party and a disaster for the country. You know, Brexit may well not have happened if, if it hadn't been for Jeremy Corbyn, if we'd had a better, stronger leader who could have articulated the case of staying in the European Union more, more strongly to our working class base, um, it, you know, we might have had a different result. Uh, but you know, that was just part of the hideousness of those five years. And they were a lot worse than, than you know, people even you know, knew at the time or, or say now, because a lot of us went through um, you know, nightmarish times in our local parties trying to persuade decent, long-standing, moderate Labour Party members to stay in the party and not to leave because of the toxicity of some of the, some of the meetings and some of the stuff that was uh, hurled at them. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was probably a more stressful and difficult time than being a very busy, busy um, government minister uh, in terms of you know, emotional stress and kind of sick, sick feelings in the, in the pit of the stomach and, um, and all of that, um, which is one of the reasons I threw myself so enthusiastically into Keir Starmer's leadership campaign and uh, came in the top 10 of the National Canvassing League for him. Um, How was that calculated? <laughs> well, it was a very good app, actually. Oh, uh, app. Somebody, some, some, some new tech whiz kid that Keir was on, got, got on board with Keir invented this amazing app. Which, um, which meant that you could, in, in real time, you could see how many people you'd spoken to and, wow. and where you were in the league table. Oh, and league that, table I, got a, I got a sweatshirt for it. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Have you still got it? I have got my hoodie, yeah, very, yeah. Pr very proudly. Very good. Very <laughs> my, good. My, Keir, my, my red Keir hoodie. Uh, so let's move on to Keir Starmer then. Keir Starmer in a word. Strategic. Uh, that... that it, has he got the right strategy? Yeah, yes, he's had the right strategy from the start and that's another reason why I threw myself so wholeheartedly into his campaign. He knew exactly what he had to do. I think his 10 pledges were a mistake, by the way, and I told, I told him so and his people so at the time. He didn't need to make those 10 pledges. Do you think um, he'd have won anyway? He would have won anyway, yeah, he would, he would have won anyway. Um, and, um, uh, but anyway, I, but that's, that's by yeah. the by, you know, it was in a different time, a different context. It was pre-COVID, so forth. Um, but no, I've always felt, I mean, I ha, you know, I've never had a kind of conversation about strategy with Keir, yeah. but I've, I've, I've watched him and observed him, and I, I've always felt he, he understood exactly what the Labour Party needed to do to um, regain people's trust, change the party, um, uh, um, take the fight to the Tories, which obviously was difficult during the COVID thing because the public want, want you to rally together and then come up with a with a compelling Labour offer for, mm. for the next election. 
and he's been s steadily and methodically working his way through all of those. I was incredibly pleasantly surprised by how quickly and ruthlessly he established, re-established control over the party and its mm. machine after it, it had been lost to the hard left. I mean, we'd never lost We'd never lost the Labour Party to the hard left before, even in the 80s. I mean, the, it was close in the 80s, uh, but, but the hard left were in control. And that was quite, you know, that is quite, that was quite, well, very difficult. And, you know, within a year, um, it, that was over. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think I trust, I trust his political instincts. I think his, I think the, his background, his, his, you know, um, relatively humble background and some of the stuff he went through as a young man and so forth and his professional career for me um, uh, have, have, have given him with strategic competence but also good political instincts and judgment. You know, he's not, he's not a Tony Blair in, in terms of charisma um, but, you know, for goodness sake, after what we've had with Boris Johnson and, and, and stuff, I think the British public are crying out for a bit of quiet competence um, and that's certainly the feeling I get on the doorstep. Do you think he's going to win a majority? Yeah, I think he will win a, win a majority. I think, um, I think, uh, I think the, the Tories are tired, they're clapped out. You, if you speak to them privately, they'll admit they need to spread an opposition to regroup. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, there's a very strong, it doesn't feel the same as 97 in terms of the level of positive enthusiasm for, for Labour and, 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 and the enthusiasm we had then for Tony, for Tony Blair, but there's a very strong time for a change feeling out there. And that is usually the most significant um, indicator of, of, of what will happen in an election once you've neutralised your weaknesses, whether it's economic credibility um, or, or security, which I think he has very, very well. Is there anything that the Conservatives did that you thought was the right thing while they've been in government? Equal marriage? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was a bit, they stood rather over blew it because it wasn't that different from civil partnerships, but it was nice to get the icing on the cake. <laughs> um, and it was very nice that they made it retrospective as well, so it meant that people like me who'd had our civil partnerships under the Labour government were automatically converted yeah. to marriage and backdated. Do you think the hard bit was the civil partnerships? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, um, and the reason we didn't call it marriage was because it, that was how we got o overcame the, the resistance in the House of Lords, including from uh, institutions like the Church of England, with, with whom I'm still having some battles on this on this front. But no, it was um, all credit to David, to David Cameron, and, and you know some of the other stuff they did on the environment under David Cameron. I think Theresa May, uh, uh, you know, looking back now, it, one feels quite nostalgic about Theresa May. <laughs> C certainly on, on on equality issues, she was she was absolutely fantastic and and uh, and still and still is yeah um so yeah i mean i um uh, i think my austerity was a mistake but i'm not i'm not one of those people who, who thinks that all you know tory governments never do anything useful or good um but i think they do they, they don't do as well as labor ones uh, let's uh, turn to some of the other um exit interview questions do you think we equipped you properly to do your job? Did you have the right skills going into politics? No, no, we have absolutely no idea and no training whatsoever. You, you sink or swim, you learn it on the job. There's no ministerial induction or training, and nobody tells you how to do it. I mean, I read a, a book by a former Labour politician, How to Be a Minister. It uh, wasn't particularly useful because it was quite <laughs> out of date. Um, and, you know, it's a shame, actually, because some, some of my colleagues who were perfectly competent and you know would have gone on to make great cabinet ministers crash and burn because they didn't have any support and made silly mistakes and um or you know didn't take the house of commons seriously or those kind of things so um it's uh, you know it's actually we're i'm well, there's a group of us in 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 the plp at the moment who are trying to help uh, the current uh, a batch of shadow ministers who've never been in government. You're great peers now. You're a wise <laughs> elder. Well, I mean, I think I think. But I suppose that's the trouble. With it. It's been for such a long time. There aren't that many who've been around the cabinet table. That's right. And you know, there are the Eagle sisters, uh, me, and one or two others. Margaret Beckett, of course, Harriet. Um, and I think you know, we we, we could be very usefully utilised to uh, help uh, people and sort of point up, point up, point out some of the some of the you know, easy, easy pitfalls uh, when you so get on, into then If I was a, a, a young uh, shadow cabinet minister now, what would you be telling me? 
Well, um, going into it, government, it, it, don't it, it, do this. What's your top thing? Would, don't it, do this. It would depend on what you've done. <laughs> it would depend on what you've done. But but uh, just just be prepared for uh, a lot of pressure, and. Um, you know, you may never have run anything. I'd never run anything or yeah. managed anybody apart from a very small parliamentary office in my life. And then I was suddenly found myself in charge of, a, you know, th hundreds of civil servants who pack your diary from dawn till, well, after dusk every day, or would if they, or, or would if they could, if you let them. Um, you inherit a, a, a private office which may not work for you and uh, with individuals in it who may not work for you. Uh, and yet you have to kind of kind of try to manage that relationship because you want to get the most out of the civil service, um, and um, it's very easy to become completely submerged uh, and sort of drowning in this kind of stuff. Um, but you have to be very strict and. Um, Make sure you don't lose control of your diary, mainly, is what I would say. I do remember, some, I don't know why, but I remember speaking to someone in your office when you were in the cabinet and they complained that you always insist on being back in Exeter on a Friday <laughs> and they well, wanted to pack it out I mean, with things. Well, isn't that, isn't, isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's extraordinary. And actually, one of the things I, I always did as a minister in each of my new jobs was take my private office on an away day to Exeter on a Friday. So worst places to be on a Friday. Well, but also there are certainly worst places yeah. to be on a Friday. But actually, ex my extra Fridays were pretty full on. Mm. So you know, we'd go from one event to another. I'd be on my bike. They'd cycle everywhere. They'd exactly. They'd yeah. follow in a minibus <laughs> because I, I, I need. I wanted them to understand that I had another job. Mm. I wasn't just a minister in their department. I had another job uh, that was demanding, and uh, my constituents had expectations of me. But but yes, I mean those. Um, those sorts of things, and actually, it really, it really helped. It really did. Ha it really did help. I would also insist on having um, an hour in the middle of the day uh, protected, unless it was the prime minister on the phone to do yoga uh, in my office, because I found regular. In, but when you were a minister. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I found regular physical exercise was was one of the means of staying sane, um, uh, and, and a very a very important means yeah. of staying sane as well. Um, so and you know I think they, they found that sort of slightly eccentric. But, um. <laughs> Whatever works for you, I suppose. What was the what was the thing that you disliked most about the job? Um, I suppose the impact it had on 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 one's family and loved ones. I mean, when we had the expenses uh, scandal. Um, I was one of the because I partly because of my seniority at the time, uh, uh, but you know so they they focused on the on the cabinet and senior ministers first, and um, you know <laughs> Neil and I was well, I can't remember which day it was but Neil and I were plastered over the front of the Telegraph um, with a headline saying you know that um, I'd claimed uh, housing costs for my boyfriend. Um, I mean, he was my partner. Yeah. Um, all MPs are perfectly entitled to claim uh, their living costs in their constituency or in London, uh, and uh, there was no issue there. And um, uh, but there was a there was an in insinuation that there was something kind of. Uh, and there was also there was also a snatched photograph of him that made, w w went to about twenty years old that made him look like some kind of toy boy. <laughs> so, so I mean things like that. I mean you know he, there was he, hope that even what was that. And also, there was a strain of homophobia. Oh, that's about to say ten, no, no, twelve years after you were elected. There was, was still a strain there. of there's still a strain of homophobia. Yeah. To, I mean, Nick Herbert, the Tory MP, had yeah. exactly the same. So I'm not make, I'm yeah. not doing any special pleading here. But the, the the Telegraph did over gay MPs in a completely different way to the way they they did over everyone else. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I, I ended up having a complete bill of health when all of that stuff was trailed through independently and so forth. But but you know, things like that. That's probably kind of an yeah. ex one example of of the, of the sort of of the, uh, we, the the Daily Mail tried to invade our wedding as well, which was um, we were we were sort of standing on on the on on, on the grass, uh, looking down out over the beautiful Herefordshire la uh, landscape, and somebody said, "Who's that? Who's that? Who's that person scurrying along, hiding behind that that um, pylon over there?" Uh, and we'd had a we'd had a male reporter at, at the at the at the gate um, asking if they could come in and interview us. I said, "No, of course not. It's a private event." Um, but clearly, they were trying to get a picture, yeah. and um, they did, obviously didn't get a very good one because there was there was there was a, there was, a, there was a piece in the mail on Sunday, but there was no there was no picture. So that kind of that yeah, kind yeah, of that yeah. sort of that sort of stuff. But you know that goes with the territory, and I was lucky enough to have 
a wonderful husband, still have him, thank goodness. And um, you know, he, his, he, was a, he was a political journalist, so he, he, he knew the world yeah, that yeah. we were about to enter. Um, actually, more difficult for him, actually, because he had to be recused from quite a lot of stuff. He worked on Newsnight, and um, okay, so yeah, it had, you know, my, 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 my life had a big impact on him, and possibly on his career, in that he had to, he actually then moved off into, into international news because it was easier and there was less potential conflict of interest. Yeah. But there were several times when I was going on Newsnight and to be, you know, grilled by Paxman, and Neil would have to be recused from, from producing the item because uh, it was me. So what, uh, I suppose the last sort of question we need to address in your exit interviews, what, what will you do next? Um, well, nothing to start with. <laughs> uh, we, we um, four years ago, uh, with my niece, we bought a small holding in Sicily and um, uh, we love it there and I want to spend more time there. Whether I'll end up kind of spending most of my time there or not, I don't know. Uh, but. Um, kind of observing, uh, observing older relatives and friends who've retired, what seems to work best for, or has worked best for them is kind of doing nothing for a while, for you know, a year or so and seeing how that feels and, and then deciding then that you it's yeah. your ones are intolerably bored uh, or actually this is rather nice, uh, I'll carry on and that's, I think that's what we're going to do. If Strictly picked up the phone and said, <laughs> Ben, you've got the reputation for being the best dance in the Commons, if is it party conferences, you were with topless belly dancers. No, you were topless with belly dancers at Ed Miliband's victory party once. You had to have an operation on your knee, didn't you? For, was it disco knee? That was too much raving, yeah. <laughs> if Strictly picked up the phone, would you do it? I'd have, they'd have to be very, very persuasive because having, looking forward to the light at the end of the tunnel and removing myself from public life, which is, I have yeah. to say, part of the attraction of retiring, yeah. becoming a private person again, why would I want to go through with doing something like you that? You the new balls. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm, I, <laughs> one of the Matt, one of the things, going back to what I was saying a bit earlier, that I'm really looking forward to about leaving politics is is being a private citizen again and not having to put myself out there, as it were, in in one form or another. Um, I think I'd rather be tending to my olive trees in Sicily than strutting around uh, on the television. I suppose I should have uh, congratulated at the beginning. You've just received a knighthood. Mm. Uh, um, congratulations, but thank you. Timing wise, at the exact moment that Boris Johnson's devalued honours yeah. to the lowest possible. Well, that, that's one of the reasons I f I've been feeling rather conflicted about it. Although I will stress, it was the King's list. That yes, I was of course. On, yes, it's not a Boris Johnson, not the Johnson's knighthood. list. You're far uh, too look, old and experienced <laughs> to have got the gold. Yeah, no, list. I had to think about it. I had to think about it. Talked over, talked it over with Neil quite a bit. Um, because you know it is a, it is a it is a throwback to what's well, not even a throwback it's still going on to this sort of heterogeneous um, uh, patriarchal system whereby you know if you're a knight your wife gets to be a lady if you're a dame your husband gets nothing if you're a gay knight your husband gets nothing so um, but you know it's um, I didn't want to be churlish about it and what what's what's made it easier is the response I've had from particularly from my constituents who seem to be very pleased which um, is nice. What would you so, like Neil to be called? What would, what, would be, what would be the right? Just Neil, and I, I'm, I'm still just, I'm just asking people to still, still call me Ben if He's that's okay. He's not calling you Sir Ben at home. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not calling him Lady Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right too. Ben Badshaw, it's been an absolute pleasure. And like so many of the MPs who've been on the um, exit interview so far, I've known you for a long time from our Western Morning News days, and you're always very helpful then as well. So Ben Badshaw, thank you very much for joining us for our exit interview. Absolute pleasure, Matt. Thank you.